Hello students, I'm teacher Thaddeus Baluka, a passionate chemistry teacher at Alliance High School. And today I want to make a presentation dealing with organic qualitative analysis. You expect 10 marks in paper three from this particular area. That is 25% of what is tested in paper three. It is a must be tested. So work with me as I try to navigate and simplify this particular topic, I've prepared slides for you, special presentation that will enable you to be able to understand this particular area better. So the presentation, the presentation is a journey through the mind of a, the presentation is a journey through the mind of an examiner touching on organic chemistry, chemistry practical analysis by Thaddeus Baluka. Welcome. In this presentation, I'll try to unpack, to unmask, illuminate, and demystify the organic qualitative analysis. Wherever a student is waiting for an exam, you focus on three main areas. And what are those areas? You are focusing on what is tested, how it is tested, and what is expected. The organic qualitative analysis tests for functional groups. So this is the checklist for organic qualitative analysis. And the first thing that you'll be asked, the first thing that will be asked in the, the checklist takes you through what can be tested in paper three. So one of the things that will be told is hard water or add ethanol. You can also be told to burn. You can also be told to add bromine water. You can also be told to add sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium carbonate. You can also be told to add acidified potassium dichromate 6. You can also be told to add acidified potassium manganese 7. You carry out a stratification, add magnesium ribbon. You can also be told to test the pH and add sodium hydroxide. So it is important to be able to know by the end of my presentation today, you are supposed, I expect you to know when you add water, what are your expectations? what is the expected observations, and what is the expected inference. The observations is about what you can perceive with the three major senses, that the sense of sight, that is what you can see, what you can feel, and also the sense of smell. We don't deal with the sense of test for practical qualitative analysis because remember the laboratory rules, we talk about never test anything in the lab. So because most of the reagents we use are, are poisonants, the sense of test is never used in practicals, maybe in theoretical. Number two, so for observation, you're looking what you can see, the smell, and also what you can feel. The observation is what you deduce, what you can conclude is present from the observation. So the conclusion will be derived from the correct observations. So the observation is the most important thing in a chemistry particle. So let's look at 
Let's start with the first one. So we'll look at the first one is how the compound burns. And burning is testing for unsaturation. And unsaturated compound is a compound that contains the compound, unsaturated compound is a compound that contains a double a double or a triple carbon carbon bond very important that is what we deal that is what we're testing for and a compound containing a double a compound that contains a double carbon carbon bond or a triple carbon carbon bond that compound burns with a yellow flame or with a yellow sooty flame. So remember when you're burning, we are looking for unsaturation. So let's look at the expectation of the examiner, the expected. Uh, first of all, how will this one be tested? You can be taught to scoop a portion of the solid using a metallic spatula and ignite it using an aluminous flame. You can also put a few drops, if it's a liquid, in a watch glass and ignite. So what are the expectations? So I've said if it's a solid, you're going to scoop using a metallic spatula. If it's a liquid, you're going to put a few drops, like one, two drops in a watch glass, then you ignite. So the possible observation will be either to burn the blue flame or it burns the yellow sooty flame. I said if a compound is saturated, it will burn with a yellow sooty flame. So if it burns the blue flame, then there is no, it is not unsaturated. So you say double bond, triple bond as shown there, abundant. If it burns with a yellow flame or a yellow sooty flame, then you conclude double bond, triple bond present only. That's the only thing that you are support right. Remember it is wrong. Some students, we don't, we say that when you're in organic qualitative analysis, we are testing for the functional groups. Alkanes have no functional groups. So this is wrong. We don't test for this one. We don't test for, we don't test for, for single bond. We are not testing for single bond. So this one is very, very wrong. So if it burns the blue flame, it is double bond, triple bond, absent. If it burns the yellow sooty flame, double bond, triple bond, present. And remember, you have learned in books and you have seen in books that Al cannot burn with a blue flame. Some books are also captured by writing ROH present here. That is wrong. Some books will also have written, you also have seen in some book writing here, if something burns with a blue flame, they write alkane, they write alkane present, others will also write ROH or alkano present. That is not correct. So those are, whatever I given there, either burn the blue flame, double bond, triple bond present, or burn the blue flame, double bond, triple bond present. The band the bands with a blue flame, double bond, triple bond absent, or burns the yellow sort of flame, double bond, triple bond present. That's if it burns the yellow flame or yellow sort of flame, or burns the blue flame, double bond, triple bond, up with them because burning, we are looking for unsaturation. Then we continue and we look for some like this. We are looking for this. So we are looking at the test for polarity. And in test for polarity, it is important to understand that we are looking at, we can have water. Water is a polar solvent. Water is a polar solvent. And either no, 
is a non-polar solvent. So in testing for solubility, we are looking at polarity. So it is important to know that the reagent you can use there is either water or ethanol. Water is a polar solvent, ethanol is a non-polar solvent. If a compound dissolves in water, it is non-polar. If a compound dissolves in water, it is polar. If a compound dissolves in ethanol, it is non-polar. Why? We have said water is a polar solvent. So if a substance will be able to dissolve in water, you can conclude that substance is polar because polar compounds dissolve in polar solvents. On the same note, if a substance dissolves in ethanol, you conclude that substance is non-polar because ethanol is con by convention treated as a non-polar solvent. A non-polar solvent dissolves non-polar compounds. Very important to capture that. You have also seen that ethanol is also able to mix with water, but Although ethanol exhibit both polar and non-polar properties, we treat it as a non-polar solvent. It is more non-polar than polar. So let's look at the test for polarity. You can be provided with a solid. And what will the examiner tell you? You can be told to play the solid in a test tube or distilled water. Then the inference, the observation here is the solid dissolves in water to form a colorless solution. The inference is the solid is polar, or rather, is a polar compound. You can also add water, and the solid partially dissolves in water or you say some solid remain undissolved and capture this one very clearly. It is partially dissolved or some solid remain undissolved. You cannot be given an exam whereby you just add water then the solid does not dissolve. This, the exam stopped at that particular moment. That is not a possibility, remember, I started by saying, when you are waiting for an exam, you're looking at what is tested, how it is tested, and what is expected. For this particular kind of a question, you can refer to KCSE 2012, question three. KCSE 2012, paper three, question three. Very important for you to look at that. So if some solid remain undissolved, then you say it is non-polar. Some student write, a white precipitate here, that's wrong. You cannot get a white precipitate by adding water. Capture that one right. Others will talk about a polar organic salt. Again, that one is penalized. So we look at test popularity, continued. If it is a liquid, now we are looking now, this is not a solid, this is not a solid. Now we are looking at, sometimes the exam will give you a liquid. Remember, you cannot say a substance is soluble in a liquid. You talk about, it is about miscibility. The liquid is miscible in water to form a uniform solution. The liquid is miscible with water to form a uniform solution, rather, um, an homogeneous mixture. If it is miscible, then you say it is polar compound. The liquid, like the case of paraffin, can be immiscible with water and forms two layers. Then you say that compound, or rather that substance, is non-polar. Very, very important. So here we are talking about miscibility, miscible with water to form a uniform solution, or simply no two layers are formed. This one is immiscible, then you say non-polar. Some students write, this one is 
forms two layers, then they infer it is immiscible. There's no inference like that. So whatever you are adding water, you are looking for polarity. If a substance is miscible with water, then it is polar. If it is not miscible with water and forms two layers like paraffin, it is non-polar. Another scenario is the use of solid, but now here we are adding ethanol. Remember we said ethanol is an unpolar solvent. So if the solid, if you place a solid in a test tube and you add ethanol, and the solid dissolves in ethanol to form a colorless solution, then you conclude that substance is non-polar. If it dissolves in ethanol then you conclude it is non-polar. Then if it's a liquid and is miscible with ethanol to form a uniform solution or rather homogeneous mixture, then again, you also conclude it is non-polar. If it is miscible, if it is miscible with ethanol to form a uniform solution, then you say that substance is non-polar. On this kind of a scenario, it's important to understand that uh, Sometimes we may bring uh, a question that will require you to invoke uh, the concept of role of a solvent. Like we can give you a solid, then we tell you to divide the solid into two portions. To the first portion, you add water, dissolve to form a colorless solution. Then you divide the resulting solution into two portions. The first portion, you test the pH, you have added water, you get pH one, you say this is strongly acidic. You add sodium carbonate, you get bubbles of a gas. Then you conclude hydrogen ion, hydroxonium, RCOH present because they are bubbles that are adding sodium carbonate. Then a portion of the same solid, you add ethanol. Then you take the pH, you get pH of seven. Then you say this is neutral substance. You have sodium carbonate, no bubbles. Then you get hydrogen ion, hydroxonium, RCOH present, RCOH absent because there were no bubbles. So the explanation for this, you need to invoke the concept you learned in role of a solvent in topic one, that is acid basis, salt, and solubility. That when you have a compound, that can dissolve in both polar and non-polar solvent. That can dissolve in both polar and non-polar solvent. Remember, when you dissolve that compound, when you dissolve that compound, when you dissolve that compound in water, when you dissolve that compound in water, it exhibits the polar properties because water is polar. So if it's acidic, it's going to exhibit either the acidic or the alkaline properties. But when you dissolve it in a non-polar solvent like ethanol, it becomes molecular, exists in molecules and is neutral. Remember when you learned HCl in methyl benzene and HCl in water. In HCl in water, exhibit polar properties, the acidic properties that it can react with a carbonate, it can react with a metal, it also got active electricity. But when you put HCl in methyl benzene, it exists, it is molecular, and therefore it is neutral. Very important for you to be able to understand that. So I have said you can be given a solid. You divide it to two portions. The first portion, you add water. Then you tell the pH, you get pH one, strongly acidic. You add sodium carbonate, there are bubbles. You say there's hydrogen ion, hydroxonium, RCOH present. Then the one that you've added either, you are getting the pH of seven. Then you say this neutral. There are no bubbles with sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate, get that one right. 
reference is made to KCSC 2009, question three. And in that kind of a scenario, whatever you are using boiling tubes or test tube, they must be dry. Because if you use a moist boiling tube, remember the, the few drops of water in the boiling tube or rather in the test tube will be able still to combine uh, with the solid and make it polar. So in those kind of scenarios, in both cases, you're still going to be getting pH pH one, pH one, strongly acidic, strongly acidic. So make sure that you use a dry boiling tube. So the other one is esterification. And in esterifications, we are in esterifications, whereby you can be told to add ethanol, followed by a few drills of conch sulfuric acid or rather dilute sulfuric. In practical, they are not going to use concentrated sulfuric acid, but you're simply going to use dilute. Still dilute sulfuric acid will still work in esterification. Very important for you to be able to capture that. It's still going to work. So it's not a must yet to be a concentrated acid. We rarely use concentrated acid for particles due to safety precautions. So if you add ethanol, ethanol then a few drops of sulfuric acid, and then you warm, and you get a pleasant smell. Then the inference is RCOH present. You can also write it like this. You can also write like this, R, C, O, O, H. You can also write like that. RCOH present, correct, but it's wrong to write COH. This is not correct. So if you want to write like that, you have to put a dash there so that each carbon atom has four bonds. So either you write this, you can write it like this. Let me highlight proper. You can use it like this. You can write like this. You, you can write like this or you can write like that. Those are the correct scenarios. Without this dash here, then the, the, the bonds are not complete and you're going to lose all the marks for that. Why are we saying the RCOH is present? Because esters, they are the one that has a pleasant, they have a pleasant smell. They are formed when an alkano reacts with alkanoic acid. So remember, you are adding either no and sulfuric acid to a solution which you don't know what is present. Then you are getting a pleasant smell, which means an ester. So it means an ester is formed between an alkano and an alkanoic acid. So because you have added an alkano, it follows the substance that you are testing, or rather you are analyzing, must be an alkanoic acid to be able to form an ester. So that is why we are confirming like that. And remember, an ester has a pleasant smell, not a sweet smell. Why do we use, why do we reject the sweet smell? The sweet smell, the sweet smell is rejected because when you use the term sweet, you are referring to the sense of taste which is perceived by the test bands, which are found in the tank. But the smell is usually perceived by the olfactory bands, which are found in the nose. So you make sure that you get those things clearly. Smell is pleasant. Don't even use the fruity smell because some fruits have a very bad smell. So the most suitable term to use is a pleasant smell. You can also add ethanoic acid. You can also add ethanoic acid, followed by a few drops of dilute or rather conch sulfuric acid, and you get a pleasant smell. A pleasant smell is a smell of an ester. An ester is found when an alkanoic acid and an alkano combine in presence of conch sulfuric acid with warming. 
Therefore, in this scenario number two, we have added an alkanoic acid and we have an ester here, which means whatever the substance you are analyzing must be an alkano, and therefore you conclude that ROH is present, not OH. ROH stands for the functional group for alkanoids. RCOH stands for the functional group for alkanoic acid. Very important to capture that. Number three, we're going to note that test for solubility. Test for solubility. Test for solubility should not be confused. Test for solubility should not be confused with test for solubility should not be confused. Uh, the test for solubility when you're adding ethanol should not be confused with esterification. Why? Because some students, when we tell them add ethanol to a solid, then they start talking about esterification. That's wrong. For esterification, you can be able to clearly differentiate it when we are dealing with solubility or other polarity, because in polarity, we simply add ethanol to a solid, then it dissolves. But during esterification, we add ethanol, then it is followed with, it is followed with, the, 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 the ethanol is followed with conch sulfuric acid, then warming. It is important to be able to capture that. It is important to be able to capture that particular area whereby students try still to confirm that particular area. Students still try to confirm that, which is not a... Students uh, tend to, conf uh, to confuse that part whereby we are adding ethanol followed by uh, sulfuric acid. That is when you're dealing with esterification with when we are dealing with when we are dealing with solubility. So make sure that you are able to capture that particular area. We can be able to capture that. Look at that slide there. The note there that uh, test for solubility. Test for solubility of organic compounds, whereby you add either or is sometimes confused by student with esterification. But in esterification, the addition of ethanol is followed by addition of a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid with gender warming. So make sure that you don't confuse the two. Whereby we simply add ethanol, we are not adding any acid. So you know that when we are testing for polarity. Test for pH. Normally in testing for pH, you are supposed to put two cubic centimeters of the liquid or other solution in a test tube, then you test the pH using a universal indicator paper. And it is important to understand that every universal indicator comes with its own chart. So when you are given a paper, if you are given the universal indicator paper, you should use the pH chart on that particular paper. If you are given a solution, you are supposed to use the pH chart on that particular chart on the, on the, that is embedded on that particular universal indicator solution. Don't just pick any pH chart from the lab to use it. And this information is very, very important to teach us. So once you are testing the pH, you get the solution, you insert the inversion indicator paper, then the color that you match the color of the inversion indicator paper with the pH chart, then you record the correct pH. You can have a pH of pH 1, pH 2, or pH 3. I remember when you're recording, it's important to understand. Get this right. Get this right. That you are supposed to give an exact pH. Like if a student writes pH 1, pH 1 to 2, this is wrong. We don't accept pH 1. You don't give a pH rent. It must be a specific pH. It must be a specific pH. So like, for example, you are seeing, let me erase this. 
So remember, I said, if it is pH, you are supposed to give, you are supposed to give a pH, a specific pH one, pH two, or pH three. Then the inference, you tell us which is that. Like when you get pH one, pH two, or pH three, you say the conclusion is, this is strongly acidic. If you get pH four, pH five, or pH six, then you say, this is weakly acidic. pH eight, nine, or 10, then you conclude this is weakly alkaline, or rather weakly basic. pH 11, 12, pH 13, or pH 14, you say this is strongly alkaline, or rather strongly basic. pH 7, you say this is neutral. But remember, we are talking about weakly alkaline, weakly acidic, strongly alkaline, strongly basic, not a strong acid. A substance can be, can be, when a substance has a pH of one, does not necessarily mean it's an acid, but it is acidic. So get that one right. So still here, yeah, before I, 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 I get out of here, is that there's always another common fallacious assumption that most students, they think all organic acids are weak acids and they force they have they want to get a pH of five. That is not correct. Most of the organic acids that have been tested in KCSE, they are strongly acidic. Not all organic acids are weak acids. Some are very, very strong acids. Get that one right. So we also have another scenario of adding, we are testing now for acidity. Testing for acidity, you can use test a pH, but we also have other scenarios by use of sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate. So when you add sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate, you are looking for the, the key word that you'll be looking for is effervescence. We are looking for effervescence or bubbles. We are looking for effervescence or bubbles. So if you're adding sodium carbon, there are only two things that you'll be looking for. There is effervescence or no effervescence. So I'm still right bubbles or, or rather the right colorless gaps. So you cannot see a colorless gap. So the marking point will be tied to bubbles of a gas. You can also be told to take the gas using a burning splint. So you're going to say bubbles of a gas that extinguishes a burning splint. Then you conclude hydroxonium, hydrogen ion, or RCOH present. Any of them is correct, but now this is the most correct answer. Make sure that when you're giving that, you always give this. This one is very, very important because you are in organic chemistry and organic compounds, these are, you see these are organic acids. So this is the most correct answer. In fact, if the examiner has identified from the stem of the question that you are provided with an organic solid J, the only answer that is going to score is this, the carboxyl group present. Or you can also write it like this. But remember I said, if you write the carboxyl group like this, if you write the carboxyl group like that, this will be wrong. So we don't mark that. For it to score, you have to put either R or you put a dash there. Very key for you to be able to capture that make sure that you're able to capture that. So if there are no bubbles, then it is hydroxonium RCOH present. And remember, how do you get the hydroxonium? The hydroxonium, this one, somebody might wonder, what is this? This simply, when an acid dissolves in water, it gives the hydrogen ion. So when you have the water, this is water now, this is water combining with hydrogen ions. 
what do you get? The hydrogens become, they are two plus one, three, and then we have oxygen. The, the charge of water is zero, and for hydrogen is positive one. Zero plus positive one, you get positive one. So that's how you drive the hydroxonia, because we have the hydrogen ions. When an acid dissolves in water, it releases the hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions combine with water to form the hydroxonia. So simply, when you talk about hydroxonia, we are simply talking about the presence of acids. So that's the important measure that we're able to get what is that. Number two, as I've said, if the compound is identified in the stem of the question as organic, then only, then only the COH will score. Only the COOH will be able to score. Very, very important for you to be able to understand. Very important for you to be able to understand that. Now, we continue. And we are looking at, you can be told to put the two cm of, of F, or rather particular solid F in a test tube, add all the magnesium metal provided. Add all the magnesium metal provided. And test the gas produced using a, a burning splint. So when you add a metal, here you are still te testing for acidity. So you expect to see the evaporations, or rather bubbles of a gas that will put off, that put off a burning splint with a pop sound. Then you conclude, again, hydrogen ion, hydroxonium, RCH, just like the carbonates. So remember we said, we reject this. For it to school, you include O, O, H, then a dash. So that the carbon will have four bonds. The rationale is this, that when you open the structure of this, you're going to have like the way you see a one, two, three, then four, like that. That's how you are able to get that. So if there are no bubbles, then it is it is now going to be hydroxonium, hydrogen ion, RCOH present. And remember I said, because it's organic chemistry, this is, this is the most important thing that we expect to, this is what makes you school, the, the carboxyl group very important in that particular area. Make sure that you are able to capture that very, very carefully. So we have said if there are no bubbles, then you talk about hydrogen and hydrogen RCH uh, uh, absent. And remember, like when you're adding, like when you're adding, a, there are some things that students write. Like when you're adding sodium carbonate, you are only looking for two things. Either there are bubbles or no bubbles. I remember I started by saying, you are focusing on what is tested, how it is tested, and what is expected. So when you're adding sodium carbonate, a student, you know, a sodium carbonate will not react with some like exane or either not. So it sets us at the bottom and when you check, I still say a white precipitate is formed because that is what they're going to be seeing. But you cannot see a white precipitate by having sodium carbonate. So whatever is there is only that because the sodium carbonate cannot react with the, the non-polar compound. So it just remains. So remember you're not looking for that. You are looking for bubbles or no bubbles. There is no observation there as like a white solid remains or uh, you say a white precipitate. There's nothing like that. It is bubbles or no bubbles. Get that one very, very clearly. Let's continue. Let's continue with the slides. Let's continue, we get more notes. So the other one is, you are also testing for acidity. You can be told to place solid F in a test tube, place that or solid F in a test tube, add sodium hydroxide. Then the solid 
dissolves in sodium hydroxide to form a colorless solution. This is a solid, remember, it is a solid. Very important to understand that. This is a solid, not a solution. It has dissolved in sodium hydroxide to form a colorless solution. So the inference that you're going to give there is the solid is acidic because it has dissolved in sodium hydroxide. A student, this is not very common, but it was once tested in KCSE. You can refer to KCSE of 20 of 1996. It was once tested there. So when a solid dissolves in an acid to form a colorless solution, then you say the solid is acidic. On the same scenario, but this one now will be test for in, in organic qualitative. If a solid will dissolve in if a solid will be able to dissolve in an acid to form a color solution, then you say this solid is basic. I remember this, don't confuse this with the test for cations. When you add sodium hydroxide in test for cations, you are normally adding sodium hydroxide not to a solid. You don't add sodium hydroxide to a solid, but you normally add it. You normally add it to a portion of the solution. Normally, when you'll be dealing with test for cations, you'll be adding add sodium hydroxide solution to a portion of the solution, not solid. So that one you cannot talk about solubility, but this one is special. So get that one right. Use of acidified potassium manganate seven. So the acidified potassium, when you are just going to be told to play the solid, uh, a portion of solution a test tube, add acidified potassium uh, dichromate six, or add potassium acidified potassium manganate seven. So let's look at that. There's a, a little correction here. So we need to make that correction. So we are looking at a, when you're adding, when you're adding, a, uh, when you're testing for, uh, you can be told to add acidified potassium. You can be told to add acidified potassium dichromate six or acidified potassium manganate seven. So acidified potassium dichromate six, acidified potassium dichromate six test for ROH. Acidified potassium dichromate six test for ROH. So there are two things that you can be able to say from there. And let us see what we expect, what we expect to see when we are using the acidified potassium dichromate six. This one test for ROH. And what are the expectations? When you are using acidified, when you are using acidified potassium dichromate six, you expect to see the color change changing from orange to green. So there are two scenarios there. The acidified potassium dichromate six changes from orange to green. Then you conclude ROH is present. Not OH. You are talking about when you test for this. We are in testing for that. We are looking at test for acidified potassium dichromate six changes from orange to green. You conclude ROH is present. Or the orange color of acidified potassium dichromate six remains orange or does not change from orange to green. Then you conclude ROH is absent. Remember, acidified potassium dichromate 6 does not test for unsaturation. It does not test for double bond and triple bond, although some books have captured that. So, acidified potassium dichromate 6 only tests for ROH. 
and ROH alone. Remember, it's also wrong. It is also wrong for a student. Remember, it's also wrong for a student to write OH present. This is wrong. It's supposed to be ROH, not OH. So we don't mark, we don't mark uh, those issues of uh, OH. It is supposed to be ROH. It's supposed to be ROH. So if you a student writes, or H, we give it a wrong. So it's about to be our H. So there are only two scenarios there. Either they are certified potassium uh, dichromatic changes from orange to green, or the orange color remains orange. So don't, uh, don't say the acidified potassium manganese 7 does not change color. You are to mention the initial and the final color. So it is important to capture that the orange acidified potassium dichromatic changes from orange to green, ROH present, or the acidified potassium dichromatic does not turn from orange to green. Very important then you say ROH is up there. Remember, I repeat again, the acidified potassium dichromatic only tests for ROH and ROH alone. So we continue. We continue. And we look at the other one that is acidified potassium manganese 7. So you can get, if you add acidified potassium manganese 7 to a portion of a solution, you can only see two scenarios. The purple color of acidified potassium manganese 7 changes from purple to colorless, or rather the purple acidified potassium manganese 7 is decaralyzed. So when you get this, uh, that the purple potassium manganese 7 is decaralyzed, rather changes from purple to colorless, then the conclusion we expect you to we expect you to give us the following. Number one, you are supposed to talk about double, double bond. We expect to talk about triple bond. We expect to talk about, we expect you to, to, to give us that there is the double bond. We have the triple bond and the ROH present. So there are two marking points that the test for unsaturation and the ROH. So the acidified potassium manganese 7, so of course, they will tell us they read the, the original, the original color, which is purple, and the final color, which turns to colorless, or it is decaralyzed. So it is important to give out the, it is important to give out the, the initial and the final color. So again, or the purple, the purple acidified potassium dichromate six, the purple acidified potassium does not is not not the color that does not change from to colorless. So then you tell us now you have to tell us you have to infer that double bond, triple bond, ROH other than because it has not changed color. So it's very much important for you to be able to capture that. For this, you need to understand these are one of the reagents that is as two functional groups. But the only reagent that tests for both unsaturation and ROH. Very, very important. The others are only having one test. So the other one is the use of bromine water. You can be taught to have bromine water. Bromine water is yellow. So the possible observations are as follows. The yellow bromine water is decaralyzed, or the yellow bromine water is not decaralyzed. We don't accept the color of bromine is as yellow. And we don't accept the color of bromine as brown or red brown. The color of bromine is yellow. And I repeat, the color of bromine water is yellow. I want to clarify something there that allergens have very funny colors. And I think you can get a pen 
you record it. That, I just want to give you the colors of allergens. Fluorine is a yellow gas. Chlorine is a green gas. We don't accept, don't give two colors in chemistry. Fluorine gas is yellow. Chlorine is green. Bromine are three colors depending on the state. Bromine gas is brown. Bromine solution, which we call bromine water, is yellow. And bromine liquid is red. So in chemistry practical, we deal with bromine. In chemistry practical, we deal with bromine solution, which is yellow. So when you're adding a few drops of bromine water, you are looking for the following observation. Either the yellow bromine water is decaralyzed or the yellow bromine water is not decaralyzed. That is the most suitable answer. Then what do you conclude? If it is decaralyzed, if the yellow, I say the most suitable answer will be giving the initial, the yellow bromine color turns color or it decaralyzed, then you say double bond or triple bond present, or the yellow bromine water not decaralyzed. If not decaralyzed, then you tell us now double bond and the triple bond is absent. That's it. Very important to be able to capture that particular area. So make sure that you're able to get that bromine water is not brown. It is not red brown. Why do we reject this? Because for those who do biology, you know that hydrogen solution is brown. So therefore, bromine water cannot be bromine water cannot be brown bromine water is yellow that's very important also when you are drawing the when you are naming this we don't accept this the double bond like that each double bond should have four bonds like that so that you are able to capture one, this carbon atom should have four bonds. One, two, three, four. The other one is one, two, three, four, like that. So for this one, again, you should have a bond here on top. You should have that. You should have that. And you should have that. So that finally, finally that if you are looking at that, if you are looking at that, you have this bond number one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, that like that. So make sure that for the bond, you are supposed to show the four bonds of carbon must be clearly shown. And then now we are looking at the common mistakes that students make during the chemistry paper three. And those mistakes are follows and the emerging trends one is that now many students, many students will find that acidified potassium dichromate six will test for the ROH double bond, triple bond. That is wrong. So the acidified potassium dichromate six only tests for ROH and does not test for unsaturation. So if a candidate will include the double bond or triple bond, then you lose all the marks. Bromine water is not brown or red brown. The correct acceptable color of bromine is yellow. If a candidate commit herself to brown color or red brown color, he or she loses all the marks. The most suitable color of bromine is yellow. pH students must give a specific pH, not a red. Normally, possibly pH strongly acidic, we normally go for pH one and two because it's a strong acid. But of course, normally, for strongly acidic, you can get pH one, two, three. But normally, the most suitable there for very strong acid, normally pH one or pH two. Common mistake when inferring nature of solutions, the correct term used there is strongly acidic, strongly alkaline, strongly basic, no strong acid or strong base. Very important. The same we talk about weak acids, weak, uh, strong acids, we talk about strongly acidic. Uh, weakly acidic and all those kind of things. Test for hydrogen. The hydrogen puts off or rather extinguishes the burn explained with a pop sound, but it does not burn with a pop sound. 
always mention the initial color and the final color of the reagent, e.g. acidified potassium dichromate 6 changes from orange to green, not acidified potassium dichromate 6 turns green or solution turns green. We don't mark those things. When you're adding bromine water, acidified potassium manganese 7, acidified potassium dichromate 6, it is the, the, the reagent that are changing color. So you can say the yellow bromine water is decaralyzed, not the solution, or rather the yellow solution, not the purple solution, not the solution turns from purple to colorless. It is the acidified potassium manganese 7, which changes from purple to colorless. Esther has a pleasant smell, not a sweet smell. Because they use the term sweet when you're referring to the sense of test, whereby you're using the, the tank, rather the test bands. That is never tested in exams. It is important to look at that. Another point which many students don't give is this, that uh, normally, normally, usually, are uh, the organic qualitative analysis are independent of each other. And listen to this very carefully. The organic qualitative analysis are independent of each other. A substance can burn with a yellow soot flame. You conclude double bond, triple bond present. But when you add bromine water, it is not decaralyzed. So you are going to conclude double bond, triple bond absent. Although you had inferred it, it is uh, present in the first by burning. So burning is not a confirmatory test for unsaturation. And number two, as I've said, organic qualitative analysis are always independent of each other. So if you burn something, burn the yellow soot flame, double bond, triple bond present, then you add sodium, then you add acidified potassium, manganese seven, and it is not decaralyzed. Don't think you are wrong. It is possible to get those kind of scenarios. For that kind of a scenario, you can refer to KCSE of 2019. You can refer to KCSE of 2012. You can even also refer to KCSE of 2013, question three. So those kind of scenarios are going to show you that uh, you cannot just talk about contradictory function of group there. The organic qualitative analysis are always the independent of each other. Each test is independent, does not depend on the other test. It is important to capture that. And for you, those are the notes. I want to believe that you'll be able to get those notes very clearly. So after that, you are supposed to you are supposed to have a look at these. You get back, you get back, and from there, looking at that checklist, now you can be able to tell us just make your own summary note on this side, like when you add either no, what are you looking for? You are looking for what? When you burn, what are you looking for? Bromine water, what are they test for? Sodium carbonate, you summarize. Dichromate 6, as we said, test for ROH. Uh, acidified protection manganese 7 test for both ROH, double bond, triple bond. Esterification, how do you go about it? Use of magnesium ribbon, testing for the pH, testing for sodium hydroxide. So that's very much important that uh, we are now finalizing. As I said, I am a passionate chemistry teacher. Uh, I'm teaching at Alliance High School. Of course, I've, taught, I've defined myself as a distilled uh, chemistry technocrat. I normally uh, do capacity building for teachers and for the students. Uh, I'm very passionate about this particular subject called chemistry. And just for the student to note that now, Chemistry is the only subject globally whereby we are not able to meet its demand. It is the most thought subject. So be very careful, work very well in chemistry because there are so many, so many opportunities for you. So let's look at that. I want to recommend a book that you can use. So if you have not used a for more notes like that, examples, make sure that you're able to pass through the KCC exams, all of them, you'll be able to see those kind of scenarios. So you can be able to pick that book called The Demystifying Chemist Particles that I've heard that be the fifth edition. It has all the KCSEs from 1997 to 2019. 
it, although the marking scheme there, you'll be able to see those kind of scenarios that I'm talking about there. So make sure that you're able to look at them. I've also given you the graphical analysis from there. You'll continue watching out for the next uh, presentation that I'm also going to be dealing with the, the, the inorganic qualitative analysis. So with this book, it has summarized notes. It has all the graph work. It has all the case you see uh, market scheme for the last uh, almost 26 years from 1997 up to last year. So grab a copy of that and be able to get more and more copies of those. You'll be able to get smart notes. You'll be able to see how the KCAC was marked so that you can be able to understand some of the issues that I've already handled there. So there are also other books in the top notch and that is now the top notch education. We also have notebooks and workbooks. The products that there, they contain comprehensive and accurate notes that have been, uh, we call them the distilled notes. They are the refined. They have no impurities. They are 99.9% pure. That's going to come comprehensive and accurate notes. They are workbook designed for timely revision and assessment. The summative, the summative uh, objective-based revision and questions. Into, we are also introduced the Octopus uh, revision model. The chemistry one is ready, which is now going to be able to use the Octopus technique, whereby we are able to use one question with so many uh, options that are there, all the possible areas that can be done, like in organic chemistry, like in, uh, in periodic table and all those kind of scenarios. So for both biology and chemistry, grab a copy of the chemistry uh, practical workbooks together with answer books so that you can be able to prepare yourself proper for the KCSE. Uh, this is uh, now a video detailing on what we contain that uh, these are the top-notch educations. These are paragon of excellence. We normally have the practical workbooks as shown there. We have the KCSEs, the KCSE, we have the KCSE from 1997 to 2019. We also have the workbooks that contain many, many practicals as can be shown from there. So these are the top-notch workbooks. Uh, we first of all say that we normally have the, we normally can uh, review the clip. We, we normally have the workbooks that are there. We have the practical workbooks whereby students are able to write inside. And then finally, we also have the demystify chemistry practical. So, Thank you for the uh, for listening to me. Continue following these channels, whereby you'll be able to get more and more important materials for you. In case you want to get, uh, my number is captured in that. My number is captured in the first slide. You can be able to get it from there. In case you want to get any clarification, you can be able to get it uh, from here. So we have come to the end of our lesson today. So you can be able to get the number from there that uh, we can be able to conduct, you can be able to seek for any uh, clarification uh, from ads, the top notch and the creations uh, for both biology and chemistry. Keep following. Thank you.